Welcome tonight. It's so great to have hundreds of you join us for our virtual event called We Own the Future, Democratic Socialism, American Style. Tonight we're going to be talking with one of the co-editors of this amazing new anthology and two of the authors uh, represented in the book. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and kick off with a little bit about what we'll be doing tonight and I'll introduce the authors and then we'll jump right in. So my name is Flynn. I am the publishing director for Descent Magazine. Uh, we help put this book together with the New Press. And tonight, um, we're really lucky to be joined with the New Press, the DSA, and the DSA Fund in hosting this event. Um, so this is an anthology that's really exciting. All the authors in this book are trying to answer how we can achieve democratic socialism in the US. All of them try to talk about policy, uh, broader questions, and, and really sort of set the stage for a, a wonderful debate that I think we can start to have across the country uh, about what we need to do to organize for socialism and for change today. So uh, without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce the panelists, and then I'll mention a little something about the Q&A. So uh, the co-editor of the book that is with us tonight is Kate Ernoff. She is a journalist, a fellow at the Type Media Center, co-author of A Planet to Win, and author of The New Denialism. She is also on Descent's editorial board, so welcome, Kate. The two authors that are with us tonight are Bill Fletcher Jr., who is a longtime labor writer and activist, who has worked for several unions and served as a senior staff person in the AFL-CIO. He's a former president of the Trans-Africa Forum, has authored three nonfiction books on the labor movement, and recently wrote his first fiction mystery novel. Our last panelist is Sarah Leonard. She is a writer and editor here in New York. Uh, she's on the masthead of The Nation, Dissent, and The Appeal, and is in the process of launching her very own socialist feminist magazine called Lux. Um, she has co-edited two books, Occupy and OWS Inspired Gazette, and The Future We Want, Radical Solutions for the 21st Century. So we're so happy to have you three join us today. I'm just going to say a little bit about how we're going to run the Q&A. So we have the chat box open right now. Feel free to introduce yourself for like the next 30 seconds, minute. And then we're going to temporarily close that down so folks can hear what the authors have to say. Um, we're going to do a Q&A with the authors for 30 or 40 minutes. And then we're going to open the chat back up. If people have questions they want to ask the authors, please submit them in the Q&A box, which is down at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, you can ask it in the general chat about using the Q&A function, but it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so like I said, we're going to do a Q&A with Kate and the two authors, and then we'll open it up for all your questions. So we're really excited um, to get into that. Also, anyone viewing the event tonight is going to get exclusive access to the book. Um, for only $2, you can get the book um, in a digital copy, or you can get 25% off the book at Descent. So we're going to post how you can get your hands on one of these in the chat box. So without further ado, Kate, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for putting this together. Um, well, Flynn gave a really good introduction to the book. So I won't, I won't spend too much longer um, talking about that in particular. I want to leave a lot of time um, to ask Bill and Sarah questions um, about their essays in this, this moment. Um, but just to, to say a couple words. So myself, Peter Dreyer, and Michael Kazin um, started putting this book together a while ago with the idea of putting it out, which we did um, at the start of the Democratic primary season. Um, so at the, at the beginning of this year. And uh, the idea was to sort of collect, you know, uh, collect several ideas which, which had been um, sort of circulating around on the left. And we asked people uh, sort of on the basis not to, to talk about, you know, their issue or sort of, you know, what they were sort of narrowly interested in, but really to ask people to help define socialism uh, through the lens of their own expertise. Um, and so I think we, we compiled a pretty good list um, of folks. And, and I've been um, really thinking a lot about some of the ideas that, that we put together in the book in the, in the last couple of weeks. I mean, we were writing um, with the idea both for the primary 
um, and sort of looking at, you know, building, building a socialist movement going forward. Um, but, but also sort of in the moment we were living in, right, which was um, the long aftermath of the Great Recession, um, the sort of uneven recovery that occurred after that, um, and in the midst of climate crisis, which is what I spend most of my time um, writing about. And uh, we are now in, a, in a, another political moment where all of those things are still true, right? There are still millions of people who have never recovered from the last crash, and now we're on the brink of another one, um, potentially a recession much deeper, um, potentially a depression, uh, depending on how the next couple of months go and dealing with this giant public health crisis um, that I think everyone is sort of struggling to um, wrap their heads around. So I, you know, I, I would recommend people sort of uh, look to the back. Um, I, one essay that has, uh, has been really, uh, in my mind a lot, has been Dorothy Roberts' um, essay about building an anti-racist universal healthcare system, which seems in this moment really just more pressing than ever, given the sort of um, violent disparities in uh, who is being affected by the coronavirus. Um, so I would really encourage people to, uh, to check that out. I've also been thinking a lot about um, Sarah and Bill's essays for, for different reasons, which which we'll hear. And um, I'm going to, you know, ask them, uh, start off asking, asking them both a question, but then get a little bit into um, the content of, of their essays in particular. Um, but, you know, this is, this is sort of an invitation to hear, hear more about that and kind of um, think about what you both wrote um, by now, you know, almost a year ago, I think, uh, if, I'm, if I'm getting the timing right, um, through this moment that we're, we're both living in. Um, so to kick it off, I want to, I want to, you know, pose to both of you a question. You know, we're in the middle of this coronavirus, um, and in that time, Medicare for All is more popular than it's ever been. There's a lot of talk, even from pretty mainstream circles, um, but the left has sort of won the battle of ideas. It's, we pushed uh, the, the conversation uh, in, in sort of mainstream circles to the left far, you know, far and away more than it was in 2016. At the same time, all of the wrong people are in charge, right? Donald Trump is in the White House. Um, we have, you know, various right-wing governments handling this crisis in all manner of disastrous ways uh, around the world. Uh, and it feels like, you know, in this country, the left has very little sway, honestly, over, over policy at the federal level and how the sort of stimulus packages are shaping up and how, um, how the, the government is responding to, to this crisis. And we, of course, also don't seem poised to send a socialist to the White House in, in November. So I'm wondering for both of you how each of you are thinking right now about the state of socialism in the United States and how the last couple of weeks has or have not changed uh, how, how you're thinking about that. You know, has, has the left lost? Are we, are we better off than we were a year ago? Or, you know, is this, are, are we just hopeless? Sarah? Oh, I have to answer whether socialism first. I'm uh, okay. Um, so thank you, Kate, so much. Um, and thank you also to DSA and Dissent and the New Press. Um, and I felt really um, honored and thrilled to be in a book with people like Bill who are working these questions through. Um, the first thing that I think is worth saying is that, of course, one of the things about the last few weeks is it has brought home the tragedy um, that we had an opportunity to elect someone who was advocating for Medicare for all, who had a pretty clear eyed view of what ought to be done to prevent and then to deal with a crisis like this, who has shown vastly more leadership than anyone who's actually nominated. Um, and we don't, we don't have that person. Um, we lost that fight. And I think it's reasonable um, to uh, sometimes sit in your apartment feeling that pain because it is a loss and it's a tragedy. I do think um, as to the question of whether the left has lost, I mean, the left has never lost. The left has just not won yet, always. But um, 
I think what we're thinking about is that we are absolutely better off than we were a year ago. We're just not as well off today as one year ago we'd hoped we'd be. Um, the Bernie campaign was obviously a huge organizing tool and a huge organizing effort. It served um, to bring a lot of people into politics who maybe were not in organized politics before, who will know now go on and do their things. Um, and I think we can be really grateful for the large organized networks that have been further developed by the campaign in this moment of crisis when we need them. Um, and this is actually how political organizing should work. Um, one of the um, other people have pointed this out, but our capacity to respond to the current crisis with um, things like rent strikes or organized mutual aid um, or advocacy via elected officials who are socialists or who are sort of socialist sympathetic. Um, that's all an outcome of the waves of activism that have been rolling now for about a decade. Um, so, you know, Occupy was all about a new generation figuring out horizontal organizing. Um, Black Lives Matter, without that movement in this particular moment, we would have a far thinner conception of the sorts of inequality that are underlying who's actually lethally affected, who is killed by this disease. Um, and also, we would not have the focus that we've had, and of course we need more, on the intersection with the carceral system. The fact that people are held in spaces where they're almost guaranteed to get sick, where they are prevented from washing, where they're prevented from protecting themselves from death. Um, and the focus on, um, on both the carceral system and on the specific policies like getting rid of cash bail um, that intersect there, those are, those are all a product, the visibility is a product of that movement. Um, I mean, other organizing since then in New York, we had Occupy Sandy, which was all about survival. Um, and then we had the Bernie campaign. And I think these sorts of waves of activism, we should take stock of the fact that we are far stronger and better connected and experienced than we were a little while ago. I have seen DSA people doing all kinds of things in my borough of Brooklyn um, around tenants' rights and mutual aid. Um, and I wanted to take just a second too to shout out, um, someone um, did a really good project, mostly on Twitter, um, a guy named Francis, Francis saying, um, who made a list of everything we were told it was impossible to have, but it turns out now that we can totally have it. So I'm not gonna read the whole list because it's really long, but I'll give you a few. Suspension, and these are all over the world, um, but a lot of them are in the US. Suspension of shutoffs for gas, electric, and water. Suspension of overdraft credit card and ATM fees. Moratoriums on residential evictions, rent, foreclosures, and mortgage payments providing housing to the homeless through vacant hotels, um, public childcare centers with free meals, expansion of childcare benefits, paid sick leave for gig workers, um, suspension of debt collection, free textbooks. The list goes on. Um, and I think one thing we can just see from this is that we both have this sort of growth of organizing experience, growth of organizing people, um, and we have a whole uh, new horizon for what's possible. The people giving expression to this new reality are doing mutual aid, and I, I think we'll talk about that more later. But we do have answers to the crisis that's in front of us, and there is an absolute vacuum in democratic leadership. So I think this is a moment of opportunity. Um, I also want to thank DSA and the New Press. Uh, for inviting me. Um, I, I want to start by saying something. I don't want this to be taken the wrong way. Nobody is better off right now. Um, this planet is collapsing and um, people are in dire straits and particularly people in the global north who never thought there could be a catastrophe like this. They always thought it would happened in places like Togo or Bangladesh or uh, somewhere else, but uh, you know, in, in El Salvador, but it would never happen to us. And uh, it, it really reminds me of some things that Amy Cesare wrote in Discourse 
or colonialism. So I think the, that's the first thing. We got to start there. People are suffering. People are dying. And uh, there's an ideological element to this uh, with the rise of social Darwinism, the reemergence of social Darwinism in, uh, in the form of these um, talking points from the Republicans and these right-wing armed demonstrations that are taking place that are basically saying, it's okay for people to die. I don't mean that in a scientific sense. I mean in an economic sense, that it's okay for people to die. And I think that that's got to be our starting point, because that's, that's part of the new parameter that we're operating within. Um, in terms of uh, the issue specifically of, of socialism, you know, for quite a number of years, there have been opinion polls that have gotten very little attention that have indicated that somewhere around a third of the population is open to alternatives to capitalism. And I have thought a lot about that uh, because that third, which is about like maybe 70 million people if you discount people under the age of 18, is not self-aware. Um, it is not, not self-aware as a grouping. And the, the task of the left, is to make that 70 million self-aware, uh, to, uh, to build a cohesive force that is ultimately fighting for socialism. And that means that we've got to think about organization in a completely different way. I mean, with all due respect to DSA's growth, um, you ain't close to 70 million people, not close to a million people. And most of the rest of the left are in small groups. And, and we've got to reconceptualize our relationship to struggle, our relationship to the kind of organizations that are necessary in order to prosecute a fight for power. So that's really where I, I start. And let me just, uh, just say this final point in the interest of time. Uh, we're in a cold civil war. That's not my original term. Some, I read it somewhere. And, and when I read it, I said, that's exactly a description of what we're in the situation we're in. There are some people on the right that want to make it a hot civil war, and you see them walking around with guns. But there's been a growing uh, uh, crisis, political and legitimacy crisis, within the United States that really is about two dramatically different paths. And part of what the left needs to do is be the the lighthouse that is guiding the broad, the, the ships into harbor. And, and we need to be the ones that are helping to build the broad united front to crush the right. Um, this is not about civility or lack of civility. It's about recognizing that the other side really does believe that this is their chance to annihilate us. And whether that's done the way that the fascists want with spreading COVID-19, or whether it's just weakening our organizations, weakening the institutions, the way that Trump and others are doing, it, you know, that's almost tactical. That's what we've got to be thinking about. That's what we're up against. Yeah, I think that is a really nice um, transition to what I was going to ask you, Bill, related to your chapter in the book, which looks um, looks at examples of different times the left, um, or you know, some sort of social democratic formation has taken some degree of power. Uh, you you talk about the difference between state and governing power, um, and I think the example that stood out to me, which folks can read about, and I won't you know go go at, into great length here, is um, Richard Hatcher becoming the mayor of Gary, Indiana and being sort of crushed by capital flight um, and a number of sort of conservative reactions and New York City's fiscal crisis, which folks um, may be more familiar with. Uh, and so, you know, your chapter looks at just how fluidly power can move between different levels to suit the interests of capital um, is, I would say, you know, a, a sort of overarching theme. And we're seeing this, you know, this bizarre thing where the GOP uh, right now is, is, is attempting to do a version of this in reaction to liberal and centrist governors. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of, you know, 
Andrew Cuomo, who cannot by, you know, in any stretch of the imagination be called a leftist. Um, mm -hmm. People like Gretchen Whitmer in, in Michigan. And so, you know, we're in the aftermath of, of Bernie's 2020 campaign. I'm wondering if, if you could talk about how you're thinking about organizing at different levels. I mean, you brought up the question of kind of institutional forms um, just now. So, you know, if we're not in the near term going to put a socialist in the White House, you know, what do you think are the best places for people to be investing their organizational or and their organizing energies um, right now, whether that's, you know, movements, is that state assembly races, is that, you know, city governments, um, you know, where, where do you think people should be um, really investing their, their, their time? Well, one answer, Kate, is uh, everywhere, but I, I know that's not very strategic. Um, so I'm going to answer that in a couple of different ways. One is that November 2020, we have to send Trump into retirement. Not just Trump, McConnell and, and others have to be sent into retirement. This is not a time, as some people have recently tweeted, to vote third party. Um, that is uh, cavalier and it misses the significance of the moment that we're in. That, uh, that this is not a traditional democratic party versus Republican party race. This is a race where we're in contention with a social movement. We're not just in contention with Trump. We're in contention with a social movement. It's called right-wing populism. And within that, there are fascists. This is not just Tweedledee, Tweedledum. This is a question of whether or not we're going to be in a situation where we, uh, that, that power will be further uh, entrenched within a regime that seeks to overturn the 20th century. That's the question. And people that think that they can sit it out are either incredibly naive or incredibly privileged. So first step is we've got to defeat Trump. But the, the longer term is the problem that much of the left has, which is the lack of real electoral strategies and, and, the, and the notion that our engagement with electoral politics is every four years a presidential term. So that we wait four years and then we determine who we're going to back for the presidency, as opposed to thinking about all the various down ballot races at different points in that entire cycle that we need to engage. And that means the necessity of building uh, electoral organizations. The Working Families Party is a great example. The uh, New Virginia Majority, the New Florida Majority, California Calls, uh, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth. There are these organizations that have been developing, many of them beginning once as, um, or many of the core, beginning more as uh, C3s, and then morphing into new forms of electoral organization that are prepared to operate inside and outside of the Democratic Party. So I would say we've got to build those things and we've got to tie them together. Now, the, the other thing, and I'll make this my final point, in the interest of time, is that um, in, in mentioning Hatcher, one of the things that is critical that we get is that the object, that one of, what the Republicans have done is move the strategy to strangle cities and they've done that by building up bases in rural areas in different states so that they could effectively block what municipalities and counties have wanted to do. And uh, it's uh, state preemption. And in effect, what Trump is trying to do, and, the, and, and McConnell, is a federal preemption of states. Now, so that one of the things that, that means at the level of strategy is that we cannot be content simply taking over cities as if that's simple. But we really need to have a statewide strategy in every state. We need to be thinking whether we're in Wyoming or New York, we've got to be thinking, how do we build a progressive majority in these states um, in order to stop the strangling that the Republicans have done? And whether they did it with Hatcher or Coleman Young, 
in Detroit. I mean, the list goes on and on. The, the fiscal crisis in New York, part of what happened in the 1970s, uh, which was very well documented, is the, uh, the, the Republicans in other parts of New York State refused to come to the aid of New York City. And, and so I think we on the left side of the aisle need to be thinking about that at the level of strategy. And I'll give a, a brief shout out to DSA's um, down ballot strategy in that a few minutes before I got on this call, I was phone banked for Jabari Brisport, um, who is running to represent my district in the state Senate um, and join the really exciting uh, cadre of, of, of left and progressive folks who um, are in Albany right now. Um, so Sarah, I wanted to um, talk a bit about your essay, which is you know, very broadly defined about the family and the uses of, of the family um, and kind of the question of, of care. Um, so, you know, what we've seen the last couple of weeks in, in the midst of this lockdown is uh, that what's traditionally known as women's work has really been a shock absorber for this crisis, both in its paid form, uh, in, in nursing and healthcare and care homes, and its unpaid forms. So as people, you know, are, are doing more childcare uh, than ever, um, sort of taking on the duties that are normally performed by teachers in the public school system, um, and the many, you know, staff that, that make, up, uh, make up that system. So the caring professions really seem to be having a moment. There seems to be a real reevaluation of what the work is that keeps society going. So related to your chapter, I'm wondering if you could say how you've been thinking about how to channel this energy um, in support of the, the types of policies that you lay out in your essay, which to give people just a, a quick uh, sort of preview of that um, includes everything from decommodifying housing to universal childcare um, and, you know, a, a number of other things. So how can, you know, this moment be used to strengthen uh, politics of care on, on the other end of this, this lockdown? Yeah, um, so I'll keep this tight, but I want to say that Jabari Bridgeport is also um, my rep and it was such a pleasure during um i mean amid the apocalypse to be able in a moment when we should be freezing rent to be able to call at least one of my reps and be like he needs to get on board with the ending evictions and they're like yeah yeah he signed the letter he's on it he's on it <laughs> you know and he replaced a member of the idc which was the garbage reactionary coalition blocking everything in in new york state that was progressive um, and so it has been a pleasure to see these small victories, which can be pretty meaningful at times like this. Um, so with regard to care work, without um, sort of going into the history and so forth in the, in the essay in the book, um, one of the things that's notable um, is that, of course, the idea of who is uh, deserving of care or who is deserving of benefits um, is always used as a cudgel to separate people from resources. Um, the idea that you should be, you know, working in order to deserve welfare, or you should be married um, in order to receive the basic stuff in order to live. Um, and somehow the poor and people of color and women are always on the wrong side of deserving. Um, and one of the extraordinary things right now is that the question of who deserves what has somewhat gone by the board. Um, because everybody, unless they're tremendously uh, rich or privileged, uh, is, is screwed. And I don't want to make it sound like everyone's equally screwed, um, but pretty much everyone is feeling the pain right now. And this has opened people up to a lot of universal ideas like rent freezes, which are usually stigmatized as both radical and as programs for the undeserving poor. Um, so, you know, some of the things I write about in this chapter as being things that are necessary for the reproduction of human life, um, you know, housing as a human right, for example, have become completely self-evident to most people. So right now, um, the movement on questions of freezing rent and mortgage payments are really interesting. And certainly in the city, um, everywhere I look in my neighborhood, there are signs up for rent strikes. Uh, which is extraordinary. I've never seen anything like it. Um, in my, uh, I don't know, last 
12, 14 years of living in New York. Um, and so it's obviously become clear uh, what sorts of things should be a human right, um, what sorts of things are necessary for the reproduction of life, um, who the essential workers are. Um, and as you said, this um, crisis has exposed what is in fact the everyday sadism of shock absorption in this economy. Um, one of the reason nurses are so supportive of Medicare for All is that they are the people who day in and day out see patients come in on a stretcher, needing care and asking how much is this gonna cost? It's disgusting. And they not only absorb the long hours and the low pay that capitalism assigns to this type of work, um, but they also see and absorb the pain of everybody else. Um, and I think right now, when nurses are being put forward as heroes in the way they should be every day, um, there is a sort of new awareness of the way that care work makes society possible. It keeps us alive, the ways it's profoundly undervalued. Um, the fact that if we had been listening to what nurses had been saying for uh, the last several years, we would not be in the position that we are in right now um, because we would have a proper healthcare system. Um, so I think we're looking at a situation in which, you know, capitalism has extracted so much from what is needed to simply reproduce life that things are beginning to fall apart completely. Um, I mean, you could extend that to talking about infrastructure and so forth, but there's only so much you can suck out before things stop working. Um, and we are at that crisis point and it's most obvious right now. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of uh, thinking about Medicare for all, for example, um, the heroes of this moment are the longtime champions of that policy. Um, and that's something we should be focused on right now. Um, I want to give one more shout out to BSA uh, in that, speaking of rent strikes, um, my housemates uh, have been, uh, thanks to people that they know through BSA, organizing, uh, I think it's 10 buildings now, tenants in 10 buildings owned by the same landlord um, for a rent strike, which we started on May 1st. Um, so that's, yeah, I've also been seeing just so many signs for rent strikes. Um, so I have one more question and then I want to kick it back to uh, Q&A so we can get to some of your questions. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I want to remind folks that that, that Q&A is open. Um, you can ask questions and then we'll answer them um, after, the, after this next one. Um, so finally, I, I wanted to ask how each of you are thinking about the role of the state at this moment. So. What do you see as the balance between the kind of mutual aid work that's been cropping up in communities around the country? So folks going shopping for their neighbors, checking in, um, in a way that I think, you know, is, seems new uh, for a lot of people and uh, is really meeting day-to-day -day needs that, that folks have and, and helping them, you know, stay healthy and alive. And um, balance between that and a socialist really pushing for a more robust and democratic state that can actually meet uh, people's needs and wants and, and not, you know, be kind of crumbling around us in the way that seems, um, seems to be the case now. So, you know, can we, can we walk and, and chew gum at the same time uh, in, in, in doing both of these types of things? I'll go to Bill first because Sarah just spoke. Um. Let me try to make this as brief as possible. You know, it, your question made me think about this, Kate. In the fall of 1988, I had the opportunity to go to Northern Ireland. And I was um, meeting with Sinn Féin, the leading force among the nationalist community. And I had the honor and opportunity of spending some time with Jerry Adams, who was then the president of Sinn Féin. And so we're talking and he was telling me about these co-ops, worker co-ops that they had set up and, uh, or helped to set up. And being an arrogant American, uh, despite being an African American, once you, one thing you find out when you leave the United States, whether you're black or not is how arrogant and American you can be. So I, I said, 
uh, well, how do these co-ops have anything to do with getting the Brits out of Northern Ireland? And instead of slapping me, he, he just sort of uh, grinned and he said, well, Bill, you know, our people need to survive. And it was like, wow, yeah, of course. And it reminded me of what the Panthers had talked about in the 60s, early 70s about survival programs and not counterposing survival mechanisms to the longer term struggle around the state. Now, there are people politically who have elevated survival strategies, mutual aid to the level of uh, their principle. And that that's, what, that's what they think needs to be done. I think that's a terrible mistake. Um, that, that there needs to be a fight for power. And that, but that fight is a protracted one. And as Jerry Adams correctly pointed out, people need to survive in the meantime. So setting up various mechanisms, whether it's cooperatives or mutual aid groups, visiting your neighbors, all of these things are important. They need to be organized. And it, it shouldn't just be do-gooders, it should be organized by mass organizations in our communities that really see that as their role. What we have to understand at the same time is that the right wing has been for 40 years working to transform the role of the capitalist state. And it's described as shrinking government. What it really is, is sharpening government. And it's sharpening government so that government is about uh, pretty much the repressive apparatus. And that the victories that were won in the 20th century that created a social safety net, not as great as many other parts of the world, but a social safety net, that those would be dismantled. And therefore, and, and that, that fight is not gonna be resolved through mutual aid. That fight is not gonna be resolved through worker cooperatives. Um, that fight will be resolved through a fight for power when we kick the rear end of the other side, in both in the short term, in terms of elections, and in my opinion, in the long term, when we actually can introduce socialism. We have to kick the other side and kick them hard and, and not look at this as simply the mistake that I think was made in the 60s with many of the social movements prematurely declaring victory and assuming that the victories that had been won could not be reversed because there was such a consensus in, in support of them, whether it was women rights, uh, uh, civil rights for um, people of color or whatever. Terrible mistake. So, so I think that there's, it, those two things should not be counterposed, but that as the left, we cannot abandon the fight for power. Otherwise, in effect, we are surrendering. Yeah, so um, to Bill's point, um, these things are complementary. I think you said walk and chew gum, but it's like walking and hydrating. You kind of need both of them at the same time. Um, and, you know, mutual aid work is, among other things, what any left political party should be doing as part of its organizing all the time. And I think DSA has actually been working on this. I mean, this isn't news to people on this call. Um, but to cite another international example, um, you saw a lot of this in Southern Europe during austerity post 2008. Um, and so all the mutual aid networks in Greece, for example, um, they operated independently of Syriza, the left political party. Um, but Syriza people uh, were always involved. They were always helping, they were showing up. Syriza MPs gave a percentage of their salary to the mutual aid networks. Um, and as a result, the mutual aid structures had a symbiotic relationship with the party. Um, they all operated with varying degrees of independence, um, but they certainly fed into the party at election time. Um, and when Syriza was in power, it allocated money to feed into these structures. Um, which was then sort of administrated by the network. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to, that has the asterisk that 
things in Greece have gone very badly. So it's not that that relationship um, was some sort of cure, but it was a very good example of um, mutual work between the party and the mutual aid networks. Um, it did not um, become large enough, and that's something for us to think about. Uh, Syriza was never a, a mass party. You know, it had 20,000 members, technically, something like that. Um, and the mutual aid networks, um, and this is also something for us to think about, became exhausted over time. For one thing, when I was last there this year, um, you know, a lot of people said that when the party got in power, the mutual aid network sort of, they were tired and they kind of stopped working. Um, they thought, thank God, the party is now going to take care of things. Of course, the party has now lost power. Um, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of things to sort of pull apart there. I don't know how much detail we want to go into about one example right now, or we can talk about it more in the questions. But, you know, the first message I got from my comrades there when New York was becoming a big coronavirus news story was one of the social solidarity organizers there who was like, don't give up. There are lots of ways to do mutual aid, even in a public health crisis. Like what you guys need to be doing right now is mutual aid. Um, both, as Bill said, people need to survive. Um, and also, we need to be looking at this as a way where we can, as always, be um, understanding the needs and the lacks we have in a political way and channeling towards them, uh, them towards political solutions. Um, and so it, in the mutual aid structures I've been seeing here, um, you know, these are ways that you organize people. People are better organized after participating in mutual aid, better educated after participating in mutual aid. Um, most people engaging in rent strikes are also going to be a little bit interested in housing policy. They're going to be a little bit interested in whether their reps favor eviction freezes. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a, a longer term question of, you know, building structures is often a good way um, to get the state to try to take those structures over. And that has a checkered history in itself, sometimes good, sometimes bad. Um, but, you know, I'm particularly inspired by looking at cases like the, um, the housing occupations in LA, which is both making clear the need in a morally clear way and doing it and challenging the state to catch up or to do something that's really morally abhorrent to most people watching. Um, so you certainly need that relationship between mutual aid and, as Bill said, um, seeking power. So, yeah. Yeah, you both, you both brought up um, international examples and in Sinn Féin, which is, is right now a happier story than Syriza, um, having won its election in March, um, which is, a, I think, a rare bright spot uh, for the global left at this point. Um, but there is a question in the chat about cross-border organizing. I think this is Kate, okay, just quickly before yeah. we run into the question, sorry, I just want to let folks know who may have joined a little late. Um, we, we've just been having like a question and answer portion with the authors, but please uh, stick around because this is your opportunity now um, to ask our authors questions. And the best way to do that is to put your question in the Q&A box on Zoom. Um, we will be ans answering mostly verbally at this point. Um, so that we can all be engaged in the conversation. We are also reopening the general chat box now that our authors have finished uh, their general presentation so that people can um, communicate, uh, raise questions, you know, just utilize that. So I just wanted to raise both of those things. Um, so please get your questions in. We're going to try and get as many, get to as many of them as possible. Um, and we will also be reposting a link so that people can get copies of the amazing book that all of these people contributed to at a discount. All right. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is a question about cross-border organizing. I mean, I think um, one of the things that socialism at its best moments is, has really brought to the conversation is a real sense of internationalism um, and being really connected to working people around the world. I mean, I just have, I think, focused this question in a bit. I, you know, have been um, 
looking a bit at international institutions and, and um, you know, the role that bodies like the IMF and World Bank are playing in this moment where, you know, there are countries in the global south under just crushing debt loads um, that are facing uh, more capital than has ever flowed out of the global south, um, leaving at, at this point. Um, and um, international system which was set up uh, by colonialism uh, to, to deal with that. And so I'm wondering, you know, how, how each of you are thinking about internationalism um, at this time. And of course, this pandemic is global and has a unique effect. As Bill mentioned, you know, sort of early on of, of being a crisis that the North can't really ignore um, in a substantive way. Um, so yeah, would be curious how each of you are relating to this. You can start with Bill. Um, in terms of internationalism, I think we need to think about it on a number of different levels. Uh, it may sound odd to start here, but even the identification of this virus, our attitude towards the identification of the virus displays either internationalism or chauvinism. So when, uh, when Trump and his minions were, were talking about uh, the, 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 the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus, um, this was a, a, a cynical political move that was playing to xenoph xenophobia in the United States. And one of the things that I've, I've said to people when this comes up is if you remember that the 1918-1919 flu pandemic actually started in the United States, even though it was called the Spanish flu, it started in the United States. So using Trump's rationale, the United States should be paying reparations to the rest of the planet for the death of more than 50 million people. Um, th this, vi this virus was not a Chinese thing. So one of the things about internationalism is setting the narrative straight. Following from what, uh, what they've been doing in terms of identifying the virus as Chinese has been the dramatic rise in anti-Asian violence, anti-Asian uh, racist violence. And, and so it's critical that we on the left uh, not only denounce that, but come and ally with those who are being attacked. That's one thing. Second thing which relates directly to your point is a political demand for debt cancellation. Um, and a, a third issue that I would raise is, is both direct aid, but also um, beating back the Trump orientation of um, isolationism. And I put that in quotes and the abandonment of international agreements and international bodies, most recently the abandonment of the World Health Organization. And I say the qualification about isolationism, and I'll just end here. I think many of us really don't get that isolationism in the United States is not isolationism. Isolationism in the United States, when, when the isolationist movement uh, was taking place in the 1930s, and early 40s, they weren't saying, let's pull out of Latin America. They were saying, let's not get involved in a European war over Jews. And, um, and I think what we got to understand with Trump, he's not an isolationist. He wants the United States not to be encumbered by any agreements, and th thus the United States to be able to do whatever it wants to do. And opposing that, is quintessential internationalism. Yeah, just to build slightly on that, um, you know, with reference to the 1918 Spanish flu, um, you know, people like Mick Davis have pointed out that, um, you know, the worst sites of death from the flu we're in places like British colonial India, where colonialism was causing mass starvation. And then you get a sort of horrific synergy of flu and malnutrition and mass death. And we're going to see that again, almost certainly with COVID. Um, 
So, you know, Mike Davis points to the world of slums. So in slum situations, there is no opportunity for social distancing, certainly, no health care, unclean water, um, fundamentally dangerous and, and deadly conditions for an epidemic like this. So you can see the ways that global inequality, which is ugly any day, pandemic or no, turns into a an entire world of, of, of you know, sort of hotspots of, of death and disease. Um, in all of the refugee camps, you have similar conditions. Um, and all of these camps are going to become places, some of them have, um, where there is disease um, and it's impossible to constantly wash your hands. There is no health care and so forth. Um, so you see the sort of um, sharpening of the penalty for being a person who is no longer useful under capitalism. Um, and that is um, terrifying. I think nothing makes me feel more sort of physically ill probably than thinking about that in particular. Um, there are a lot of other <laughs> sort of international questions. I mean, one, to, uh, I think for me, I, I've been reaching out to people who did mutual aid organizing under austerity. I think there's a lot we can learn from each other right now. Um, and, you know, relevant to something Bill said a little earlier, Americans often don't think of themselves as subject to some of the forces that we're subject to right now in this moment. And so in great humbleness, we should be reaching out to our comrades in other places who have encountered these things. Um, and finally, I'll say that, um, you know, thinking about Europe, the entire um, post-crisis economic policy within the EU is now being shown to be deadly. I mean, we've been saying for a long time that it was, that it was wrong, that it had um, lethal consequences, that it meant more people going hungry. Um, you know, countries like Greece, Italy, and Spain, um, the ways that they were forced to deal with debt loads and impose austerity um, resulted in suffering for a lot of people, but that is far sharper now. So just to, to be specific, um, Italy lost hundreds of hospitals as a result of austerity prior to the COVID crisis. Um, in Greece, um, hundreds of doctors are now instead of staying in Greece where austerity has sucked dry the medical system and there are, uh, it's hard to get a job, um, are going to Germany. Um, and you know why there are so many people still stuck on the islands in refugee camps. It, it, there are a lot of reasons, but one of them is that people are required to be certified by people who work for the national health system. The national health system doesn't have enough doctors because they're in Germany. Um, so, you know, you have just a, a layering of the horrors of austerity policy coming home right now because of the pandemic. Yeah, I would, uh, someone had said this, I think, today on Twitter, and I'm forgetting who, that you could probably draw a pretty striking graph uh, mapping countries which, did, uh, which really leaned into austerity after the last crash with the um, death rates that they experienced. Um, so we have a lot of questions um, that I'm going to try to get through um, pretty justly. Um, so uh, one from someone named Claiborne um, says, in the current pandemic, who decides how to balance social health concerns and individual rights? It seems like the left is favoring uh, letting health professionals decide, but health professionals have also um, promoted eugenics and things like the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Um, who makes decisions that affect our future? And I think just to expand on that briefly, um, there has been this like really uh, interesting sort of fetishization of experts and expertise, um, particularly, you know, the person of Anthony Fauci has become this sort of resistance hero. Um, yeah, and I'm wondering, you know, going off of Claiborne's question, how you both are, are thinking about this, and I'm being crowded by the powers it be um, to keep questions short, short so we can get, or to keep answers short so we can get to more of them. So I'm passing that along. 
Um, I'll just say quickly that um, Fauci is a better administrator of this entire situation than he would have been had he not been forced to radically reconsider his position as an expert by ACT UP AIDS activists who, uh, you know, relentlessly hounded him into making drugs available um, and, you know, forced him to to question most of the medical norms he was abiding by in, in terms of the testing process for new drugs. Um, activists uh, force experts to be better. We also obviously need experts, but there's a relationship there. Um, and I think right now communities are being extremely vocal about what they need. Um, and also listening to the people who are on, not just experts, but who are on the front lines, which right now often means nurses. Um, so I, I think there's a relationship there. That, that's an that's a important question. Kate, I think that um, we have to be clear that there's science, which seeks truth from facts, and, and then there are charlatans, who may in some cases call themselves scientists. Uh, Mengele, uh, the Nazi, right, was, was a scientist, um, and there were others. So um, I think that one has to always be clear as to what's going on. I think that um, the, the decisions around health need to be guided by scientific investigation and knowledge and the concern for the majority. And that part of what we're seeing instead is social Darwinism. That's what we're seeing from the Republicans. They're basically saying, and, and what that idiot uh, deputy uh, or lieutenant governor of Texas, right? People should give up their lives for the capitalist economy. Um, I, I noticed that he didn't, um, but you know, you know, I think that we've got to understand that the social Darwinism it, that they're articulating, they're saying that it's okay for people to lose their lives. I think the way we're going right now, because of what Trump has done and the lack of national coordination, we're moving very closely, and I think it's gonna to happen, towards people simply going back to work. And they'll wear masks, and the virus will continue to spread and people are gonna die. And people are gonna throw up their hands and say, well, there's no alternative because we're not getting help from anywhere else. And that's where we on the left need to be saying, that is precisely why there needs to be an alternative to the Trump insanity. And in some ways, the election in November is, a, is gonna be a choice between sanity and insanity. Yeah, there, I'm seeing a couple questions uh, about climate and the Green New Deal, which um, I will field briefly, um, and I think relates to what has been brought up, which is I, I think, I have been just really struck by um, by this kind of narrative about expertise because it's been this the this really live debate in the climate movement for the last um, 10, 20 years, maybe forever. Um, this call to just believe science um, and really you know trust the experts and, and that will um, that will yield you know the result we want. But that's not a political strategy, right? Um, just telling people to trust experts is not. Um, is, is, is not politics. And it also really props up a group of people who are, have various political aims, right? There are plenty of climate scientists who I would not trust to, to, to guide a strategy um, for how we should handle the climate crisis. And, and people have um, you know, different types of expertise, certainly in different sort of orientations toward politics. So we are always making choices about which experts um, we are sort of putting to the top of the conversation um, and, and who we are trusting to guide a, guide a democratic society. And I think there's a real um, anti-democratic ethos to it as well, um, to just hope that you know, this sort of um, very smart technocrat will um, guide us toward salvation. Um, I think betrays a real uh, lack of faith in, in human beings to do that through, um, through democratic processes. 
Um, there's also a couple questions that I wanted to pose to Bill and Sarah um, in our last couple minutes here about uh, the shape of what a recovery should look like. Um, so we're seeing countries in Europe start to ease restrictions um, and, and start to come back. Uh, and there are kind of a range of responses being, being um, laid out about what, uh, what that should look like, both um, the reopening of economies and, and kind of who is protected than that, but I think even more so um, what a, a, a stimulus um, will look like to respond to this. It seems like we're not, well, I don't know, maybe we can talk about that. It seems like there is, uh, at least for now, some acknowledgement that, that deficits are not the primary concern, even among fairly right-wing um, elements in, in the U.S. So there does seem to be some uh, some sort of coalescing around um, some basic Keynesianism, uh, even if that's uh, what it is in the UK, which is this kind of like weird Tory Keynesianism that might snap back really quickly to austerity. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what you think is the realm of possibility now uh, for what a recovery should look like and what are the sort of key ideas that people should be raising um, as, you know, the sort of non-negotiables of, of what that looks like and, and how the left might, might push for that. It's a small question, so, you know. You want to start, Sarah, or you want me to start? I'm happy either way. We have a lot of terrain. Uh, go for it. Um, okay, so I think one of the things that we're learning from the rest of the world is what happens when you don't have national coordination. And, and so one of our demands, continued demands, really should be about national coordination in responding to this crisis. Because part of the net effect, if not the intent, of what Trump and others have done is to lead people to believe that the problem of the virus is really a problem of the blue states. And that the so-called red states, a term I hate, by the way, uh, but the so-called red states um, can take a pass. And, and I think that this is where the preponderance of the scientific evidence really becomes important to make an argument about what it means to reopen an economy. Um, and the issue of national coordination. Second thing is testing. Uh, I think what, we, what we're hearing, the United Food and Commercial Workers, which represents a lot of these uh, workers in meatpacking, uh, they're saying and insisting there must be testing. That Trump telling people, telling these companies to simply open up or continue producing while people are dropping, either seriously ill or dying, is, uh, is insane, if not barbaric. And, and so I think that this demand for testing becomes very, very important uh, for the workforce. Uh, testing, the proper uh, type of quarantining, um, all of that. Now, the, the issue, one of the things that's driving the frustration, the legitimate frustration that exists is that people's lives are collapsing and they have no income. Um, the uh, unemployment offices, all of these things, the result of 40 plus years of neoliberal deregulations that have weakened the ability of government to respond to crises, that it has hit the fan. And that's what we're dealing with right now. Watching the news earlier this evening when someone for, for several weeks has not been able to get unemployment, right? Um, and, and so one of the things we've got to do is we have to have some level of guaranteed income for the duration of this crisis um, and guaranteed health care for the duration of this crisis, at least. Um, and I think that these are, these are critical demands that need to be advanced. Now, the other thing that I would say, final point in the interest of time, as uh, my friends in uh, Liberation Road and, and others have been emphasizing, is that this is a moment to link the Green New Deal and the response to the COVID slash economic collapse. That both at the level of science, 
that these uh, pandemics are the direct result of environmental catastrophe and species moving together in an unnatural way and flipping of diseases. Um, but the, the other thing that we've got to be thinking about is rebuilding and what the rebuilding is going to look like. This is the moment when we can talk about reframing the rebuilding, right? And, and talk about addressing the environmental crisis and the, the, the impact of COVID um, through a different approach to economic development, the identification of jobs, et cetera. So I would argue that we on the left really need to be strong proponents of this Green New Deal. But more than that, we got to figure out how to win it. It's not enough to just wave the flag. We've got to figure out how do we win it? How do we turn states? How do we turn uh, various representatives? We've got to move it. So um, to the question of what should happen um, with opening up, skipping over the, the immediate question of what that timing should be, which I really can't answer except like not now. Um, you know, there, there are a couple of things to the points that you raised, Kate. So one is that we've been living with this absurd economic orthodoxy for decades now that, um, you know, uh, that, that state shouldn't spend, that state should cut, um, that austerity will fix a crisis, which obviously has not worked. Um, and um, yes, and the deficits are the big problem. Um, and states have been trying to, um, to sort of, uh, fix things without spending by messing around with monetary policy and now at a point where we have negative interest rates or close to zero interest rates almost everywhere, um, you can't go much further with monetary policy in terms of trying to stimulate the economy. And so even pre-COVID, when it looked like we were entering maybe a global recession, uh, people were starting to say that states are going to have to spend again. We cannot live with the economic orthodoxy of recent years. It won't work. We've run out of space, even on its own terms. Um, so now with the COVID crisis, it seems clear that states are gonna have to prepare to spend in a way that they have not been willing to do in recent years. Um, one of the really interesting obstacles here and to Bill's point on coordination is that part of the Republican project has been cutting back the parts of government that are dedicated to social welfare. And so we actually lack a lot of the capacity to execute big programs that we as socialists would want to have. So for example, um, this week I was talking to Bryce Covert, who's an economics writer who wrote about the small business loan program that the government's doing as part of the stimulus, um, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and one of the interesting things about the program is it's malfunctioning radically. I mean, it's doing really badly. They're funneling it through banks. Banks are writing their own loan terms. It's chaotic. It's confusing. When the banks ask the Small Business Administration, which is a federal agency, what the loan agreement should look like, the SBA doesn't have any guidance for them. And what she was saying was, you know, I'm sure that individual bureaucrats here are probably doing their best, but every single agency has been cut back and cut back until it is understaffed, it's lacking appointments, um, it doesn't have enough budget to administrate a program of any size. We have completely sacrificed emergency preparedness um, over the years, or I shouldn't say we sacrificed it, Republicans, um, as well as many Democrats, um, have slashed it with a knife over the years. Um, until we are unable, even if we want to spend, to administrate a serious federal program. Um, so Republicans can talk all they want about small businesses, but they don't even have the capacity to help them because of the situation that they have constructed. So restoring the capacity to administrate things on a federal level is very important and should be part of the thinking about a socialist program because it's necessary for anything we wanna do. And then when we think about what would make up a program like that, it seems obvious that the things um, that people need right now, that people would be 
excited about programs for and that specifically people would be open to universal programs around universal programs being less likely to be taken away in the future because more people have a stake in them and they're not seen as serving an interest group um medicare for all like healthcare, people want healthcare right now. And it's, as you've said, never been more popular. And it is obviously addressing this crisis. It is obviously a thing that can, in addition, um, boost the economy. Um, I would add childcare to that, something that has long been neglected um, and that is absolutely essential um, for a variety of reasons, including people's ability to work um, and, and still have their kids taken care of because it would rationalize a sector where workers are extremely exploited right now. Um, and because it would be um, in general better to have a federal program that made it possible for everyone to have access to childcare and think of kids as um, <laughs> something we have in common in that sense um, and that we're collectively responsible for. Um, and finally, housing as a human right has to be central to any, any left program right now. Um, I, I don't want to go on any further, but, but that's where I would start. Cool. Um, we have a, a couple more questions about the Green New Deal in particular, um, which I think... Wait, Kate, can I ask you a question about the Green New Deal from the questions? Sure, sir. <laughs> We're lucky enough to have an expert in the Green New Deal here. And one question that came up in the Q&A that I can see um, is asking the panelists to address the topic of the Green New Deal as a potentially central element of our program against the right and for a positive post-crisis society. Um, and how should equity be centered in the Green New Deal? Great. This is a thing I can and have talked for hours about, so I will keep it brief. Um, I think, you know, just agreeing with Bill um, that uh, Green New Deal should be central to how we think about the response to this crisis and for many different reasons, one being the collapse of our ecosystems and sort of urgent pressing crisis of climate change um, and the fact that we can think of COVID-19 itself as a climate uh, as a climate impact, right? The, a microbiologist I spoke to um, several months ago uh, before the virus had sort of hit the U.S. said, you know, we can think of this like um, we thought of, you know, Hurricane Katrina in relationship to climate change. We don't know, you know, we can't pin it exactly uh, and say that Hurricane Katrina was caused by the climate crisis. We can say more things like that hurricane will happen uh, in, in the coming decades because temperatures are rising, right? Um, so, you know, I think we should be really thinking about this as, um, as a climate impact. Um, and I, I think the sort of pressing need for um, really having the response to this crisis be green, for lack of a better word, in nature is that there, I think there is a danger um, to do what governments do in response to economic downturns, which is to just fuel growth without any sort of claim on, on, how, um, on how the economy picks back up, right? And so just to get spending up by any means possible, to get investment up by any means possible. Um, and that is climate denial, frankly, um, to, to just sort of fuel the economy in a way that is irrespective of what um, the, the climate footprint of that, um, that actually is. And I think there are a couple of programs which I think I also saw in the chat, which can be um, sort of the, the tip of the sphere, as we know, the Green New Deal is not, you know, a, a neat sort of set of programs. I think of it more so as a, as a style of governance, right? This is a new era um, of what we think about as the relationship between the state and the economy um, and what it is that people owe and the that, that people owe to one another and that the government owes to um, the people who live within it. Um, I think a federal job guarantee uh, is, is really important in that, which had been a historic demand of the Democratic Party until about 1980, um, when it got removed from the platform, coming out of the civil rights movement and the question of how to build a peacetime economy, um, which people like Coretta Scott King sort of led the fight for, um, to, you know, figure out how we run full employment uh, and, and, you know, make sure people can have meaningful, dignified work. 
um, in a way that was not toward, you know, fueling wars overseas, which there was an essay uh, in, in this book about, which is uh, fantastic. Um, and I would, I would really recommend um, checking out. And so, you know, we have record numbers, numbers of people filing for unemployment, I think 33 million uh, as of uh, a report released this morning and uh, a private sector, which is realistically just not going to put them back to work, right? Uh, we will see more automation and more centralization. We will see small businesses closing at a record rate. Um, we're just not going to um, have the capacity nor the interest uh, to, to put um, all the people who now do not have livelihoods um, to, to provide that. So I think a federal job guarantee with an emphasis on um, doing work like ecosystem services reclamation, um, work that is, you know, uh, I think a lot more uh, uh, meaningful, uh, frankly, than, than um, really low paid work now. Um, and that can provide a, a wage floor effectively um, for the rest of the economy um, by, you know, setting the competition at $15 an hour, $20 an hour, whatever we want it to be. Um, but ensuring that, you know, Amazon, McDonald's, whoever it is, can't just pay people um, poverty wages that they have to actually compete with um, with a federal employer in order um, in order to, to attract workers, um, which is, um, you know, I think important in a general sense and also important um, for building sort of working class institutions um, as we had, you know, in, in the sort of post war era to push for further demands that we know we'll, um, we'll need. Um, and I'll say just one more thing, which is uh, about the oil crisis, uh, which we haven't, we haven't talked about now, but the oil and gas sector is sort of imploding um, before our eyes, which uh, I'll end on this, will devastate local tax bases um, and the types of workers who we've seen as the most important um, in this crisis, which Sarah talked about, which are teachers and nurses, public health systems. Um, if we you know, let those jobs just collapse um, without sort of any, um, any real backstop for people, um, that will be absolutely a depression um, for some of the most vulnerable parts of the country already. So support for um, state and local tax bases is essential, despite whatever Mitch McConnell um, is saying, and um, really being thoughtful about, about how that um, it gets distributed. Um, so yeah, let's push for a Green New Deal. There's a, a proposal out, which I'll point to briefly, um, from some folks that I know, and, and one of my co two of my co-authors, um, on a planet to win called Green Stimulus. Do you search that? There is a Medium post which will um, direct you to that. So I'll end there. Um, and I think we uh, might have time just for a couple of closing um, closing statements before we wrap up. So I'm wondering, um, Bill or Sarah, if there's anything you want to sort of leave folks with um, before we re return to our, our quarantines. Yeah, um, again, I want to thank uh, DSA and New Press. I want to thank you, Kate. Uh, and it was a pleasure doing this with you, Sarah. Um, I hope we can do this again. Um, I, I want to end by basically uh, this, this thing I've been repeating time and again that this is a cat catastrophe we're in, but that what we don't need are apocalyptic narratives that essentially lead us to believe that the world is ending. And there's much too much of that on Facebook and in other quarters where, even from some very good people, and I'm not gonna mention any names, um, but even some very good people who write about how terrible everything is, and you're waiting for them to say, all right, so we're going to do what? And there's no answer. And, and you know, I, I feel like that from the left is simply unacceptable and we shouldn't tolerate it. Um, that we don't need to tell people how bad things are. And, and the notion of you simply tell people how bad things are and that's going to inspire people is wrong. It, it, more than likely what it's going to do is people are going to close in on themselves and look out for themselves as opposed to look out for the collectivity. So I think it's, it's important that we are sober about what's going on, that we take things, uh, we take, take things one step at a time as part of a strategy to turn things around and to win. 
um, because otherwise um, we will ultimately fuel the right. The right wing and particularly the right wing populace will take advantage of the situation in a way to encourage a belief that irrationalist solutions will resolve the problem. And things like social Darwinism becomes acceptable because there's no other answer. So I just want to end there because I actually do have hope. I continue to have hope. And I think that we need in, the, in our movement to radiate that, not stupidly, but very constructively and, and link it with strategy. Um, yes, I would echo what Bill says and also um, his thanks to everyone who hosted this and everybody who came. Um, I guess, I don't wanna add a lot analytically. I would just say that this is obviously a very difficult time, a difficult time to organize. Um, most people I know feel bad right now. <laughs> um, and I think it's worth remembering with the sorts of conversations we're having tonight um, and the sorts of organizing happening in our communities, mutual aid at this time, all the rent strike signs outside, I'm not trying to put forward a false optimism about what will or won't happen. But I think it's important for us to remember that even though we're stuck indoors, we are very free. There is a lot we can do. Um, and even though we are uh, socially isolated, um, we really are doing mutual aid together. Um, so we haven't won, um, but our strength is certainly gaining and not waning. Um, and I would say, you know, optimism, optimism of the will is, you know, not just necessary because we don't all want to be pawns in an Amazon factory somewhere, um, but because every day we live in struggle and togetherness is a better day. Um, so I hope that everyone is sort of not just surviving in isolation, but, but finding those projects around them. Um, well, I don't know if I could think of a better place to end on than that. Um, so I just want to thank Bill and Sarah uh, and the new press and DSA um, and their folks for organizing this. Um, I think this was a great conversation. Thank you to like all nearly 200 of you for, who stuck around for an hour and a half um, to talk about socialism. I made this joke at another launch, but I'll make it again because I think it's good, um, which is that, you know, Oscar Wilde said socialism takes too many evenings. Um, so thank you for spending your evening with us. And just one last thing to let people know. So this is a part of um, some programming that we're putting together. Uh, Descent was also a part of putting this event together. And um, a lot of us on the independent um, media scene are trying to partner together and build the left together collectively um, to set the stage for large conversations like this where hundreds of people can come together and brainstorm about what we need to be building to create a more just society. Um, I think that this book is a great starting off point. Um, the authors have come from very different political backgrounds. They don't all um, agree on the best way forward, but the point is, is that they're articulating a vision for how to get there. And I think that that is the best place to start having this com broader conversation. And I just wanted to let everyone know that this is gonna be the first of a series of conversations we have about this book. Um, the DSA Fund it has offered to put together more of these um, in partnership with the rest of us on this call. So I encourage people to keep an eye out for emails from us uh, to have more of our wonderful authors from this anthology come and present and for you to ask other questions to um, these wonderful journalists. So thank you all for supporting independent journalism and let's organize and fight for the world that we deserve uh, to have. Thank you all so much.